Hello and welcome to Gaia. In this tutorial I'll take a Gaia terrain and show you what's possible when you add CTS to it. CTS is another product in the Procedural World suite which takes your terrain to the next level of beauty and AAA visuals. So to add CTS to the terrain I go component CTS add to terrain and CTS has added itself to the terrain. Now CTS needs a profile in order to operate so the next thing we need to do is create a profile from the the raw material of this terrain. So I go component CTS create and apply profile. CTS is now ingesting all of the content of the terrain and is now rendering the terrain for us. It's created a profile for us and in this profile are all the settings that are used by CTS to render this terrain. So let's look at our global settings first. CTS comes with a number of different shader variants. There's the light version, which is the fastest version. It removes things like ambient occlusion, color maps, snow, and various other features. Then there's the basic version, which is most of the things you'll need to get a very good result with your terrain. It's still very fast. Then we have the advanced version, which adds in height map blending and more AO options. And then we have the tessellation version, which adds in additional tessellation options. For this demo, I'll just stick with basic. So we have our general terrain smoothness, our specular power, our global normal. We don't have a global normal set up yet, so let's bake our terrains to get one. And the default settings are quite low. If I dial it up a bit, you'll see the normals kicking in. So you use these to just highlight the, the ledges and, and things in the distance. Our ambient occlusion is normal map based, but we can turn that off. You can see the difference there, turn it back on. Uh, you can choose the power of the yeah, AO that we apply. Turn that back up again. Lighting kicking in here. Uh, the global mixing distance is the distance at which far mixing kicks in versus near mixing. And this is a very powerful thing. It allows you to, to change the way things are render in the distance versus where, the way they render close up. So it's good for managing things like tiling and so on. And the default distance is 400. Let's just change that to 200. And what I'll do is I'll make it really sharp. So we should be able to see where distant where this is kicking in. So as we move this, or we move it back out, you start to see it have an effect here. So at this point, we've got near or close mixing. At this point, we've got far mixing. So look at the impact that this has on how we render this rock texture, for example. So if we go into our texture settings and look at our rock setting, and here is the tile size of our rock. Now, you might notice that the tile size looks different here than it does there. So this is close versus far. So let me go in and change our far multiplier. And you can see where that far distance is kicking in. You can see how different the rock looks there. Instead of making a very sharp mix, we can actually drop that down to make it more of a, a gradual mix. And you can see that it's actually then blending between the near mixing and the far mixing. And this concept runs all the way through CTS. So I'll just set that at say 300 meters. So that's far kicking in around there somewhere. And we'll look at the other settings we've got in our textures here. So let's just go down and we'll start from the top. The first texture I've got here is my sand, which is down here. And I can go in and change the tiling. Now my sand looks pretty good on its default settings anyway. The far multiplier for our sand, well we don't really see it so much in this scene, but again that's that multiple the tiling in the far distance, the normal power that we apply to this sand. So if I dial this up, it tends to enhance the normals in our sand. So this normal texture here, the detail power, I'll come back to that. Geological power come back, snow. We can change the tint of our sand. So if we want to change and adjust for various different scenarios. You can also change its brightness. 
Again, these are all great little things for balancing how different textures work together and also its smoothness. So you can get more of a wet look on our sand there by changing its smoothness. So you can adjust that to work with the, the actual texture. Now, texture by texture, you can also control where the triplanar shading is used. And sand is not such a great example because it's a fl it's something that typically is fairly flat. Where you want to use triplanar textures is on textures that are typically on vertical surfaces. You can see how the texture is stretched there. So if I go to my rock and turn on triplanar, you can see how it's actually fixed up that stretching, particularly noticeable around some of these areas. Now triplanar is a fairly expensive effect, so you should only ever add it to textures that are on the edges of very steep slopes, for example, this rock. So let's go and modify our rock here a little bit. It's already looking pretty good, but let's, let's modify it a little bit more. We can mess around with its normals, maybe enhance them a bit. I'll come back to these detail powers and so on in a second. Let's look at our brightness. We could bring it down or maybe lift it up a bit. You can modify these things and really, really play with the way your textures are being rendered in the scene. So the next thing I think we want to do here is let's modify our detail settings. At the moment, when we look at this terrain, it's there's no real detail and it's fairly flat. Um, actually, before I go to detail, I'll come back to our grass and let's just modify its tiling a bit. Yeah, that one looks okay. Let's select our next grass, which is this one here. Modify its tiling. Now, if you make them really, really small, or as you make them smaller, depending on your texture, you'll start to note, notice tiling artifacts. So you want to make them sort of big enough so that you don't really see them. And then you probably, you might want to modify the normals to pick out a little bit more detail on them. Don't want to do too much though, because it can look a little bit funny. So just a bit to add a little bit of detail. I'll come back to these again in a second. So let's modify our details. So if we dial up the detail here, now I'm going to make it really, really overly exaggerated just to give you a sense of the difference that it makes to the look here. You can change its tiling. So let's say we're okay with that. Now compare without detail and then just add in a little bit of detail. And all of a sudden it looks like there's a lot more interesting detail in your um, in your scene. Just helps to break it up a bit. Maybe play around with that tiling a bit. There we go. So we've changed the look of this terrain. I still think that's a bit too much. So I'll just dial it down a little bit. So this is the close power. Let's look at a detail in the distance as well, our far power. So we'll dial that up. You can see it kicking in really a little bit further there. So if I go back a bit, so you can see as we're moving forward, the detail, it's, it's not much close detail. The Distant detail is far more exaggerated. Let's just drop that back down. So that helps you break up tiling and other artifacts and add interest in the distance as well. You can also change the the tiling on the, the far. And that all looks good to me. So the next thing I want to do is add in a bit of geo or geological sedimentation. So I'll turn up our close power so you can see it there. It's really, really exaggerated. Now, these are the ones that we actually have a whole bunch of these. So let's go into our geo directory here and maybe select a different geo. So now we've got some red colors. Great for more desert type environments. And let's try another one. So there's another one. I think that's got some greens in it. So I'm going to drop that power back down. So we just get a little bit of geo into our environment here. It just adds a little bit more color variation. You can see those lines in the terrain, they're relatively subtle. Let's change our tiling. So you can see them 
if we make it quite pronounced there I would prefer generally to just make it subtle your eye naturally follows the lines but you don't necessarily know why you're following the lines now we haven't got any far geo so let's turn that on as well so we can just take that into the distance so now as we go back to the distance you can see that geo kicking in there change the offset if you want change its tiling so that looks okay to me we've turned this into a fairly rugged sort of environment here let's dial up some snow there we go now I've got geo I've got detail noise and I've got snow if we go back down to these individual textures we can now turn them up and down or modify them per texture so let's go okay on this texture I don't want any detail that texture kicks in over there we can't really see it under the snow anyway let's dial down the snow so you can see I can actually modify per texture how snow affects it and let's dial down the geological power so you can see that just very subtly that geo going away and this is very powerful because you can then you know let's say you had a texture that was at a lower altitude you can start to have the an artificial snow melting type effect going on there's a lot of things you can do with it so that's over you know overriding the detail geo and snow per texture you can drop down that brightness too if we wanted to or dial it up I'll just leave it as it is so we've got our detail set up we've got our geo set up we've got our snow set up we can then change how we optimize it so in this case the albedos are being packed in as 1k textures I think the original textures are either I'm not sure if they're 1 or 2k but they look okay at 1k anyway if you compress them as 2k textures obviously your texture array which is then being sent to the GPU is larger so you've got to think about that in terms of performance the smaller the textures the faster the system runs the larger the textures the more data is being transferred so that slows things down a bit we can also change the ISO settings 8 to a fairly good average but if you want to improve performance if you hover over it we can give you that text there you can drop it down a bit I've found that 0 and 1 you know, one still looks okay but can improve performance so we always want to compress our albedos some people have found that WebGL doesn't work with compressed texture arrays but does work with uncompressed texture arrays I think this varies by unity implementation as in platform and also the version of unity so it seems to be a work in progress but generally we recommend that you compress these because again it means we're sending less information from the from the CPU to the GPU which means you've got faster performance and load distance this is the distance at which CTS kicks into lower levels of detail so if we drop this down to say 200 you can see that as we drop that CTS is, is kicking into a lower uh, I guess a lower and more efficient version of the shader the idea is we want that out at a fair distance so that you get nice high quality rendering up close and and less detailed less expensive rendering in the distance and strip textures is a fairly cool feature when this when we play this scene CTS will remove all the textures from your terrain and turn your terrain rendering from multi-pass into single pass that means that there are less draw calls and your scene will perform better if you've got something that actually depends on those textures being in the splats on the terrain for instance walk a lot of walking systems they'll change the walk sound by the texture that's underneath the boots then you need to uncheck strip textures so that CTS doesn't remove those textures it means you're using up a bit of extra GPU memory but you know the on modern GPUs and even mid-range GPUs that's really negligible anyway but something you can consider if you want to optimize performance persist materials what that does is at the moment on each terrain object CTS has added material to that object 
Persist materials will allow you to save those materials as separate objects and then you can modify those materials directly yourself. So let's, uh, let's go and add a few more things onto this terrain. Let's, um, let's add a color map. So to change, to add a color map to this terrain, we have to select the terrain itself and actually add the color map to it. So I've created one earlier. Color map, I'm going to drop that into the color map slot. And the color map's there, but we haven't turned it on. The control of the rendering of the color map actually sits inside of the profile. The idea being that you control your color maps globally. So let's turn off transparent on our color map and dial up our color map. So you can see the difference between near and far there. So turn it up to full power. So now our terrain colors are coming from that color map and they've been blended in at full strength. I've actually defined a transparency on this color map. So with the transparency, I can choose just this, the few areas that I want that color map to be rendered in at. So let me show you the color map itself. Okay, so for this texture, this this texture here, what I've got is a texture that I created in Photoshop. And on its normal RGB channels, we've got the, the texture itself. And then in the alpha channel, I've got a bunch of flow maps. And this is the mask that's being used to paint in where that will appear. So if you want to mask out your color map, just put that mask, so use the white color to mask it in on your alpha channel. And then wherever that mask is, you'll paint in this color. So let's, as a last thing we want to do to this terrain, is let's add in a cave just here. So I go to my terrain and I'm going to select use cutout. Now that's popped in a new shader, which is our cutout shader. I'll just drop that to zero. So we want to draw all the terrain, but I'm going to use a mask. So I'll drop my cutout mask and boom, what you can see has happened is we now have the terrain being cut out at that location. Now we are not actually physically cutting the terrain out. We are just not painting it. So the terrain collider still exists at that location. We leave that to you because there's a lot of other implications associated with cutting terrain out and disabling that collider. So let's turn off use cutouts for the moment and let's just see how this thing looks now that we've set it up. So our terrain looks a lot more interesting up here. We've added detail into our grass texture. We've got our snow patching on here. You can see on our cliffs where our color map is being mixed in. And I used, a, I used Gaia to create a water flow map. And so what you've got there is where the water would flow down the cliffs looks quite cool. You could improve that by changing the texture colors. So I might make that sort of a green mossy color, for example. And the last thing I suppose I'll do is let's add our grass back in. So we can do this at runtime, select our terrain and go to our settings. Now I've turned grass down purely because I wanted to show the terrain, but in the real world or in your real game, you'd have grass. So let's set our settings here. Detail density. Dial it right up. Maximize it. So now we have a fairly cool environment. I've got lots of grass on it. I would modify the colors of my grass a bit to blend more closely with the colors the textures in the terrain, um, but that's something that is beyond the scope of this. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial.